Hey guys, I'm Georgia and welcome back for another episode in my Unsolved series. Or if you're new here, welcome. Today I want to share with you one of the most confusing cases I think I've ever looked at on my channel. A case that makes no sense no matter what angle you look at it from. The death of Joanne Matuk Romain has been dismissed by the local police as a case of suicide, but to this day so many questions remain unanswered and we have a timeline here that just does not add up. There are so many layers to this story and Joanne's family, her children, are still desperately searching for the answers that can finally allow them to rest. They do actually have an open change to all petition started by Michelle, Joanne's daughter, that's calling for the FBI, the Attorney General of Michigan and the Governor of Michigan and the US Department of Justice to take charge and finally do a proper and thorough investigation in this case. Of course, I will link that down below, but I'll let you watch the full video with all the information before you decide to sign it. I will say though that I never think any harm will come from a proper investigation being done in any case, especially when there's question around the investigation in the first place, regardless of what you believe happened to Joanne. Her case does remain open to this day, but no one has ever been charged or arrested in connection with her death. Joanne's case was slow to pick up public awareness, but in more recent years there's definitely been more media coverage. Her story was featured in Netflix's Unsolved Mysteries Season 2 Episode 5 entitled Lady in the Lake, but as Unsolved Mysteries does tend to do, it did miss out some important information. Another documentary series about this case is a six-part special by Dateline Detroit from WDIV Local 4, which features interviews with the people closest to Joanne, as well as the main person of interest in this case. Of course, the rest of my sources as well will also be linked down below. But let's begin by learning a bit about who Joanne was. She was born Joanne Matuk on May 14th, 1954 in Gross Point Woods, Wayne County, Michigan in the USA. Gross Point Woods itself is a suburb of Detroit with a population of only 16,000 as of the 2010 census, and Joanne was Gross Point born and raised. In 1980, she married her husband, David Romain, and they would go on to have three children, David, Michelle, and Kelly. And they had a fairly good marriage for the most part, it seems, but after 25 years, the couple decided to separate, and Joanne ended up moving in with her daughters, Michelle and Kelly, which is where she was still living when she disappeared aged 55. Joanne is described by those who knew her as a very happy person. She was somebody that a lot of people sort of considered a second mum. She was very maternal and incredibly loving. She would kind of do anything for anyone. She had a part-time job and was also a devout Catholic, attending her local church every Sunday without fail, but sometimes as often as two to three times a week. She knew the service schedule like the back of her hand and would often just pop into the church to pray. And this local church was St Paul Catholic Church off of Lakeshore Road in Gross Point Farms. The church overlooks the beautiful Lake St Clair, which is part of the Great Lakes system, connecting Lake Huron in the north with Lake Erie in the south, and it separates Detroit from Ontario, Canada. Lake St Clair has a surface area of about 430 square miles, so it's big, but it has an average depth of just 11 feet, so it's not all that deep. On the evening of the 12th of January 2010, Joanne headed to church for a prayer service, as she often did. On her way, she stopped to fill up her car with gas or petrol, and then headed into the service where nothing unusual was reported. At 7.20pm, a witness saw Joanne exit the church, and just a minute later, another witness reports seeing or hearing a car alarm going off, and this would be for a Lexus, which was Joanne's car. But Joanne would never reach her car though, it seems, and she would never arrive back home either. Her daughters had been out for dinner that evening and they arrived home around 9pm, realising very quickly that their mum wasn't back yet, which was unusual as they expected her to be. They tried calling her mobile phone, but there was no answer, but they didn't panic. Perhaps Joanne had just turned her phone off at the service and forgotten to turn it on. Maybe she'd made other plans and just forgotten to mention them. She was a 55 year old woman, she could go out if she wanted to. This is a point in the story where things get a bit weird and it's all a bit complicated, so you do need to pay very close attention to the timeline here. So shortly after Michelle and Kelly arrived home and unsuccessfully tried calling their mother, a police car pulled around the corner and knocked on their door. Kelly recalls this being at 9.24pm, saying she looked at her phone at the time. I suppose you would remember this pivotal moment in your life. The officer who pulled up to the house said that they'd found Joanne's car abandoned in the car park of the church. Was she missing? 
Now this is very interesting for a couple of reasons. Number one being that the car would only have been there for a few hours at this point, which is definitely not long enough for it to raise any questions of abandonment. Secondly, the car was actually registered under Michelle's name, not Joanne's. So if the officer ran the license plates, that's whose name would have come up, not Joanne's. But somehow they knew apparently that Joanne was the one who'd been driving it. Michelle insists that the officer directly inquired after Joanne, that in that moment her suspicions were raised. But the officer insists that he inquired after the Lexus itself, not a specific person. And there's no way of knowing which is true because no other witnesses can confirm or deny this. Obviously, at this point, the daughters weren't too concerned about their mother. Sure, she hadn't answered a phone, but that could have been due to myriad reasons. The police turning up at their door though was a cause of concern and they immediately started to panic calling their mother's phone again and again hoping she'd pick up and she didn't. Phone records show that these calls all took place before 10pm. The police had to have turned up and alerted them as to what was going on before that point. And despite police insisting that the daughters didn't, they immediately rushed to the church where they found a full-on crime scene. There were a huge amount of police officers, vehicles, and even a helicopter complete with searchlight flying over the lake. This is despite the fact that Joanne hadn't been reported missing by anyone. Now, if you look at the official police reports in this case, you'll start to notice some inconsistencies. According to said reports, Lieutenant Andrew Rogers had been the first one to notice that Joanne's car was in the car park at 8.58pm and he ran the plates at that point but he didn't see any need for concern and deemed no action was necessary. About an hour later, so just before 10pm, a police officer called Keith Colombo ran a second check on the plates and it's at this point that he says he spots some footprints in the snow running from the car to the lakefront. Of course, it's Michigan in January, there's snow on the ground. The officer said that he was alerted to something untoward going on when he saw there was only one set of footprints leading to the lakefront and no footprints leading back. It seemed as if somebody had just walked into the lake. And I'm sure we can all agree that this genuinely does sound like a cause of concern, but there's just one small discrepancy here. This was just before 10pm according to police reports. If only now the police are realising there's an issue, why had Kelly and Michelle been alerted to the mother being missing over half an hour earlier? We know the approximate time they must have been told because their phone records show frantic repeated calls to their mother well before 10pm. Since then, the police have insisted that they turned up at the daughter's house at 10.24pm, but this simply doesn't match with the phone records. As I said, when they arrived, a full search was already happening and Coast Guard records kind of back this up. At 9.30pm, the Coast Guard were notified and eight minutes later, they launched a full crew arriving at the scene, the lakefront at 9.51pm. Again, this is before the second officer says he'd ever ran the plates. Now, in the publicly available documents from a later civil suit that Joanne's family made against a number of law enforcement officials, there is reference to this timing discrepancy from the Coast Guard. Reading verbatim, it says, Several pages of the Coast Guard search and rescue file reflect that it was contacted about a person in the water off Lakeshore by GPF Lieutenant Rogers via landline at 10.33pm. The Coast Guard situation report, however, apparently reflects that assistance was requested at 9.30pm, an airboat was launched at 9.38pm, and the airboat was on scene at 9.51pm. In an affidavit submitted in support of the GPF defendant's motion for summary judgment, Bruce W. Sacco, the Coast Guard officer who received Lieutenant Rogers' call, states that these earlier entries are incorrect based on his personal recollection of the events in question and other entries in the search and rescue file. Now, I'm not here to push the story in any particular direction. I'm sharing the information as I found it online. Again, all my sources will be linked down below. The fact here is that there are two separate Coast Guard reports pertaining to this night. One which matches the police timeline and one that doesn't. And it's difficult because all the Coast Guard officer has to offer is his word that the earlier report is wrong as according to his own recollections. But Joanne's family are accusing law enforcement slash all authorities here of being involved in some sort of cover up or of being corrupt. And if that is the case, then it's not surprising that said enforcement would take the stand and potentially lie. You'd hope that it doesn't happen, but it does. A lot of the cases we cover on my channel are unsolved due to law enforcement just simply not doing their jobs properly or sometimes even worse. This is a truly complex case that we're dealing with here. It's one that makes you doubt the words of everyone. 
When Michelle and Kelly arrived at the crime scene, they later testified that they saw caution tape around the Lexus and an officer using a tool to open the car door. We can deduce that this means the car was locked. Michelle would say that she saw the officer get into the car and take out Joanne's black purse before searching its contents and both her mobile phone and car keys were missing. Joanne's bag was apparently quite new, but her daughters would note that the bag was torn. It wasn't torn on the strap, but instead sort of on the leather, as if a seam had come loose or ripped, as it seems from photos. As the tear was not on the strap, officers said that it didn't appear that it came from physical struggle or suggest evidence of any foul play. However, a private investigator later brought in the case said that the tear does indicate foul play, or at least that somebody might have grabbed it and tried to rip it away from Joanne. We'll talk more about Joanne's body later in the video because she was eventually found, but she was actually also found to have a bruise on her arm, which the PI says is consistent with somebody grabbing at her as they pulled at a bag. The Lexus would eventually be dusted for fingerprints, but according to the Dateline Detroit series, this was done incorrectly. Fingerprint dust was just thrown around the car haphazardly, including onto the leather seats of the vehicle, which apparently is the incorrect way to get fingerprints off of leather. Now, I didn't know anything about this, so I've done some research, and it seems like it is actually difficult to develop fingerprints on leather articles. An article on ForensicReader.com states, Fingerprints can be developed on leather goods using forensic powder and chemical methods, but not all fingerprints result in development, especially those registered with less moisture or less finger residue. Essentially, what this means is you'll only find fingerprints using dust on real leather items if a person has more moisture on their fingers. So if a person is sweating or has external moisture, if the air is humid or if the person's been eating very oily foods. Regular fingerprints, if you've not been doing any of those things, probably aren't gonna be very visible. In these cases, dust will actually probably hurt your chances of finding prints on leather surfaces. Instead, what you need is good lighting and a really good camera. So basically, as soon as the dust was thrown around the whole car, any chances of finding prints on the leather seats were destroyed. There was also no DNA search done of the car, with investigators saying there was no evidence of a violent crime that warranted DNA check being done. So basically, in terms of forensic evidence, the car was pretty much useless. From pretty much the first moments of this investigation, police were working under the impression that they were dealing with a suicide. They say this is due to the single path of footprints in the snow leading from the car to the lakefront and nothing showing this person returning. Gross Point Farms Police Chief Dan Jensen would say at a later deposition that when they saw this, they just went into rescue mode, hence the massive crime scene. However, Joanne was actually wearing high heels to church that day, and the photos of the footprints don't show dainty heel prints, they show boot prints, a much larger shoe than Joanne would have been wearing. But the civil suit report says that the original prints were not preserved, as when members of the Coast Guard arrived, they just walked through the area and destroyed them, essentially. And this was a serious crime scene, why did they not preserve this very important piece of evidence? Regardless of your opinion in this case, this does seem to be a fuck up on the police department's behalf. I know it's snow, I know it would have melted eventually anyway, but there are ways to preserve forensic evidence like this. This is Michigan, there's lots of snow, they would have had access to this technology, I'm very sure. Joanne's car was parked in the car park of St Paul's Church, which at this time had actually been cleared of snow. The footprints were said to have started on the pathway, which was actually a significant distance away from the car. Some sources say 75, some say 100 feet. There is quite a distance to then make the connection to Joanne's car. I do have to wonder how they did that. I assume her car was the only one left in the car park. But it hadn't been abandoned long enough for anyone to think it was suspicious. And it also wasn't an easy walk to the lakefront either from this car park. There were concrete embankments and multiple obstacles to climb over on the way. Could Joanne, a 4 foot 10, 225 pound woman who wasn't particularly fit and was also wearing heels, have done this? Well, yeah, she certainly could have done, but it wouldn't have been an easy feat by any means, and not a single witness saw her on this journey. And then we come to the lake itself. As I said earlier in the video, Lake St. Clair is a very strange one because whilst it's certainly very large in area, it's not very deep. In fact, for the last century, a deep trench had to be maintained across the middle of the lake for trade routes, otherwise boats or ships simply couldn't travel through because it's not deep enough. And I'm not exaggerating when I say it was incredibly shallow, it is incredibly shallow. Four foot ten Joanne would have had to walk the lengths of two football fields through the water until she reached a point where she was completely submerged. 
Now, of course, we all know it's possible to drown in as little as just a couple of inches of water. So Joanne dying in this lake is certainly not impossible, but taking your own life in such a way, it's very difficult. It was actually surprisingly hard for me to find any stats around this. The best I could find was in regards to here in the UK, where in 2021, drowning accounted for just 3.5% of suicides, a percentage that's remained pretty consistent every year since 2001. The human body has a very strong survival instinct, even when the mind doesn't want to survive, and therefore a lot of the time in situations like this, biology will take over and try to save itself. It's not usually a case of just putting your head underwater and waiting. Of course, I'm not ruling this out completely, but it is hard to do so. Most suicides by drowning are when people just walk out too far into bodies of water, so there's no hope of survival. But like I said in Joanne's case, this would have consisted of walking two football fields deep into Lake St. Clair. Again, not impossible, just improbable. It's just another thing that raises questions in the minds of Joanne's loved ones. But then you've also got the fact the records show that the lake that night was very calm, there wasn't a particularly strong current. If Joanne was out there, her body wouldn't have washed away all that quickly. Her body was found by fishermen 70 days later on the 20th of March in Amherstburg, Ontario, which is south of Detroit and downstream of the Canadian River. The Canadian Coast Guard responded to the fisherman's report and the link was made with missing Joanne pretty quickly after the body was ID'd as female and it matched her basic description. She was soon transferred to the coroner for the province of Ontario for an autopsy, which was performed two days later on the 22nd. It was found that the cause of Joanne's death was something called dry drowning. Usually when someone drowns, their lungs are found full of water, but in the case of dry drowning, the water never reaches the lungs. Obviously, I did some research on what exactly this means and how it happens, and the simplest explanation I found was on clevelandclinic.org, which read, when you're struggling for water and unable to come up for air, you experience a reflex called a laryngeal spasm. This spasm shuts off your airway, meaning you can no longer breathe. When this airway closure happens and no water goes into your lungs, that's technically dry drowning. So, no water was found in Joanne's lungs, but this has interesting repercussions on the search for her body. Technically, if her lungs were full of air instead of water, this means her body would have been buoyant and she should have been floating on or near the surface of the water. If a helicopter was out there with a searchlight, should they have been able to see her? That's just another point in this case that's up for debate. In total, Joanne has actually been through three separate autopsies. The first autopsy with the Canadian coroner, Dr. Marvin Oxley, noted that neither the USA nor Canadian police suspected foul play. And whilst Joanne's entry into the lake was not witnessed, circumstantial evidence suggests that she may have intended to take her own life. The report also made a note of presumed paranoid psychosis, but we'll get more into that in just a moment. However, Dr. Oxley also noted that there was insufficient evidence that Joanne intended to take her own life. Therefore, he concluded that the cause of death was drowning, but the manner of death was undetermined. It says, quote, where she drowned and when she drowned are subject to discussion. I think because this case was marked down as suicide so early on, the media really didn't cover it to the extent they may have done if it was considered unsolved. This does mean that potential witnesses who might have seen something that night may have completely missed their opportunity to come forward. By the time any fuss was made, many people would have forgotten if they'd seen anything on Lakeshore Drive that night. The second autopsy took place in the USA the very next day at the Macomb County Medical Examiner's Office by Dr. Daniel Spitz, and he came to the same conclusions as Dr. Oxley. At the insistence of Joanne's family though, a third autopsy would happen two days after that at the University of Michigan by Dr. Jeffrey Jensen. He said that the cause of death was most likely freshwater drowning and the manner of death was again undetermined. He noted there was no significant trauma but there were contusions on the left upper arm. The bruises I referred to earlier when talking about the ripped handbag, Joanne was always known to carry her bag on her left arm. Another point to note around all this is that Joanne's shoes weren't found to have any scuffs or damage to them. If the suicide theory is correct and she did indeed manage to walk all the way down to the lakefront and make her way into the lake in her high heels, she did so without damaging them in any way. And then the final point I want to make in regards to the autopsy and the point surrounding it is the fact that it would have been incredibly cold at this time. 
According to historic data from timeanddate.com, in Detroit on the evening of Tuesday 2nd of January 2010, it was between minus 4 and minus 6 degrees Celsius, that's 21 to 24 degrees Fahrenheit. So it was definitely very cold, it was below freezing. Very cold weather to choose to walk into a lake. Here in England for the last few days, it's been between about minus 4 and minus 6 here, 24 hours a day. It is very cold, it is icy, every bit of water outside is completely frozen. I can't say personally that in this weather, I would choose to walk into a lake, but of course we don't know what Joanne's mental state was at this time. I've seen speculation from people online that had Joanne walked into the lake, her body might have been taken over by the cold before she even had a chance to drown, which of course is hypothermia. I'm not claiming to be an expert by any means, so I don't know if this would have been noted in the autopsies, but it is interesting to think about. Maybe she died of hypothermia before drowning. Next, I want to move on to a couple of other interesting pieces of evidence that have been pointed out in regards to this case. This case is full of so many little things to point out that I do feel like I'm jumping around the timeline a little bit, so please do excuse me. First, I want to talk about a scarf. At 7.50pm on the night Joanne disappeared, a witness saw a man wearing a scarf running away from the area of the scene, running away from the area of the church. At some point later that evening, an officer would find a black scarf on Lakeshore Drive, the same long road the church sits on. The scarf was confirmed not to have belonged to Joanne herself, but the fact that it was found combined with a witness seeing somebody in a similar scarf running away from the scene was something to be noted. This may well have been important evidence in this case, but we'll never know because later that same year it was donated to Goodwill. Evidence in a case like this being donated to charity, it seems insane, but hey, they'd already dismissed Joanne's case as a simple suicide. The next clue slash interesting tidbit in this case is in regards to a pair of car keys that appeared at the police station the day after Joanne's disappearance. Now these were actually a set of spare car keys that had gone missing from Joanne's home about four to six weeks earlier. Joanne had mentioned to her daughter that they disappeared, but then here they are the day after her death at the police station. The keys were not found in her handbag and nobody has ever quite seemed to answer the question of where they came from. One officer testified that the morning after Joanne's disappearance slash death, somebody at the department instructed him to go and retrieve a set of keys for the Lexus. No one knows who gave him this instruction, nor could the officer remember the address he was sent to to pick them up. He also couldn't describe the person who gave him the keys when he arrived at said address, and nor could he remember who he gave the key to once he was back at the police station. I think we can all agree that this situation is incredibly strange. Where did these keys come from? Why were no records kept? These keys were apparently missing and then here they are suddenly reappearing at the police station with zero paper trail. Why is this officer going to a specific address to pick them up? That suggests that they weren't just found at the scene. These were the spare keys. Joanne surely would have been using the proper set, the main set, to drive around that day. But let's say for argument's sake that Joanne did find the spare car key in the previous four to six weeks and she just didn't mention it to her daughters and she was using it to drive around that day. Where was this key found? Was it on the ground next to the car? Was it in the church? Was it on the lakefront? Was it anywhere in the journey from the car to the lakefront? Who found it and where was it found? That could answer a lot of questions, but we don't know. We have no idea where this key came from. And regardless of what you think about this case, that should have been noted down. That's an important piece of evidence. That surely should have been put in a little baggie and kept as evidence. But it wasn't. It was just at the police station. I must admit, this is the biggest point about this case that gives me pause. Some have said that the situation around the car keys was just another aspect of Joanne's paranoia though, something which I did mention in passing earlier in the video. In the months leading up to her disappearance, Joanne had made some passing comments that some could definitely take as paranoia. But paranoia is only that if it's untrue. If it is just happening, it's really fact. Was Joanne's disappearance the culmination of her fears? Did what she was fearing most really end up happening? But why would somebody want a 55-year-old housewife dead? And if it was a suicide, what had happened in Joanne's life to lead her to that point? What had made her so paranoid in the first place? Remember, Joanne was a deeply religious woman. She was a devout Catholic, and suicide is not allowed in Catholicism. She would have known the church's teachings around such a thing. 
If she did take her own life, then she really would have reached a point of no return. However, Joanne's own doctor has said that she was not suicidal, nor had she ever been diagnosed with any psychiatric disorder. Of course, we never know what's going on in someone's head, but before the maybe paranoia, Joanne had never exhibited any mental illness, no depression or anxiety, nothing. She also loved her children more than anything in the world and she would have done anything for them. Alongside the Catholicism, people who knew her say she never would have left her children behind. She lived for her now adult kids. But what was Joanne's supposed paranoia all about? Well, it seemed to centre around a man called Tim Matouk, her own cousin. I want to stress here that Tim has never been a suspect or so much as a person of interest in Joanne's death but his name is one that pops up often in telling this story and in telling what happened to Joanne, I have to mention him, otherwise nothing else makes sense. In the months before Joanne's death, tensions have been high within the Matuk family over, as family disputes often are, an inheritance. It was the death of Joanne's own parents that began it and the family was divided. Siblings no longer speaking, cousins involved, it was a whole mess. Joanne had been telling people that if anything ever happened to her, Tim was the one to look at. And then something did happen to her. At this time, Tim Matook was actually a Harbour Woods police officer who then went on to become an investigator with the Wayne County Prosecutor's Office. Growing up, Joanne and Tim had been close, but they drifted as they became adults. They started their own families, they just weren't as close anymore. There was never any bad blood until the inheritance row. In mid-December 2009, just weeks before her death, Joanne was overheard by her daughters talking to Tim on the phone. Although they couldn't hear the other side, Tim's side of the conversation, they did hear yelling and raised voices, their mother telling Tim to keep his nose out of everyone's business. It was after this phone call that she made the remark that if anything ever happened to her, to look to him. And she would go on to say the same thing to multiple other people as well. And I do want to note that this was unlike Joanne. Friends and people who knew her say that she wasn't a particularly vengeful person. So to have a grudge like this was out of character for her. She would never fully share with her daughters what was going on though. They knew there was tension, but they didn't know the details of it. In the later civil suit, a paralegal would testify that Joanne told her, Tim Matook said to me, if someone wanted to get rid of you, they could do it and you would never be found. And the paralegal also said that generally Joanne was suspicious that someone was following her, either Tim or someone acting on his behalf. However, of course though, Tim denies all the allegations that have been made against him over the years. He never spoke out about this until speaking for the first time to Dateline Detroit for the aforementioned six-part documentary series, saying that he feels he's been the victim of a witch hunt from the Remain family. His version of the story in regards to the December 2009 phone call was about a meeting that Joanne had just had with her brother Bill. Now, Joanne and Bill had fallen out in the inheritance row as well. They hadn't spoken in a very long time. But in her suspicions of Tim, Joanne had actually decided to go and pay a visit to her brother at his business, Woods Wholesale Wine. Joanne's daughter would say that she was only in the building for a matter of minutes, but when she came out, she was more freaked out than when she'd gone in. Joanne wouldn't share with her daughter what conversation had taken place or what had happened inside, but Joanne immediately insisted that she goes to church and pray. In a later court deposition, Bill would say that Joanne came in that day and said that she wanted to make amends, but she also started making accusations against Tim, saying that she was warning Bill to stay away from him. However, Bill said Tim was a good guy and Joanne didn't like the answer. That was Bill's version of events. But to add a whole other layer to this story, we also need to talk about another Matook sibling, Bill and Joanne's other brother, John Matook. John had been having some problems recently and he'd been convicted of writing bad checks as well as conviction of false pretenses. Tim says that part of Joanne's problem with him was that he was law enforcement and therefore she believed that he must have been involved in John's convictions, which he says he wasn't. To this day, we don't know what really happened the day of that meeting. As we can see, there are multiple different versions here. Did Joanne see or hear something she shouldn't have? Was she threatened? We don't know, but we do know she seemed scared. After this point, she was sure that something was going to happen to her. And this is where all the accusations of Joanne being paranoid come from. But again, I stress, paranoia is only paranoia if nothing is actually happening. And we don't know whether it was or not. 
Tim Matuk has testified under oath that he had never threatened Joanne, but of course he would, anyone would. Maybe he's telling the truth, maybe he's not. There was clearly bad blood between the two, but how deep did this go? As we know, this case was declared a suicide pretty quickly and any chances of a big investigation were swept under the rug to the despair of Joanne's loved ones. Eventually, they actually sued the police for access to the documents in Joanne's case and they found out there was an eyewitness who had actually placed Tim Matook at the scene of Joanne's disappearance. However, the police dismissed him as they didn't think he was a credible witness. Now, this witness was a man called Paul Hawke, who on the 18th of January 2010, so six days after Joanne disappeared, met with the chief and a detective from Gross Point Farms. Hawke had originally reported that he'd been driving along Lakeshore Road mid to late afternoon on January 12th, when he noticed two cars stopped on the eastbound lane, so the lane closest to the lake. One of these cars was dark navy blue and the other was an unknown colour, as well as noticing a woman sitting on the brake wall. He would describe the woman as heavy set with black hair matching Joanne's disappearance. The woman was said to be motionless and slightly slumped over, which made him immediately concerned for her well-being. Hawke paid attention to the scene, he said, because it was all very suspicious. As he passed the vehicles, Hawke saw two men, one who he described as Caucasian, over six foot and about 240 pounds. The second man had dark features, six foot and under, was about 200 pounds. Both men were said to be wearing long dress coats. However, nothing ever came of this report because as I said, detectives didn't think it was credible, suggesting that the sighting came too early in the day for it to have been Joanne. And they also said there were inconsistencies between different statements that he made, which to be honest, there were. Whilst in earlier statements, Hawke's details were very vague, later statements he made seemed to contain much more detail. In a June 2014 affidavit, he became suddenly able to describe the two vehicles parked by the lake, one as a black or dark blue four-door sedan and the other was a silver Lexus SUV. He even said that the blue sedan had a license plate beginning BHP, details he didn't include in the earlier statements. When Paul Hawke felt like the Grove State Farms Police weren't taking him seriously, he even went as far as to go straight to the Michigan State Police and the FBI regarding what he saw because he believed it, he believed his version of the story. He was very insistent that what he saw that day was important. And as far as I can find, he really was just a random eyewitness. He had no connection to the Matuk or Romain family. In June 2014, Hawke said that he would be able to positively identify the man he saw that night and after seeing a photograph of Tim Matuk, he said that he was able to identify him with absolute certainty that he was one of the two men he saw on the side of the road that night. However, this entire 2014 affidavit would be stricken from the record by the judge in the civil case and Paul Hawke would sadly be found dead in his home around this time last year, 2021, so he's no longer alive. So was Tim Matuk really one of the men on the side of the road that night? According to him, that's just not possible as he actually has an alibi for this time. He was at work. As I mentioned previously, at this time he worked with the Harbour Woods Police Department and that night he was working with the Michigan State Narcotics Task Force in Warren. His shift ran from 2pm to 10pm. Although no officers actually saw Tim that night, they did have consistent contact with him via the radio and the lieutenant overseeing the unit said that it would have been improbable for anyone to leave the surveillance that night. Not impossible again, but improbable. And phone records do seem to back this alibi up as well. 21 calls were made between 3.49pm and 8.54pm placing Tim in Warren. Some do question whether Tim had somebody acting on his behalf, whether someone else harmed Joanne on his instruction. But then you've got Paul Hawke insisting it was Tim himself on the side of the road. I told you this is a very convoluted case and I'm not here to share my personal opinion. I'm here to share with you the facts or at least the maybe facts in this case. And these are the facts. As of today, it's said that the Gross Point Police Department still won't talk about this case, even though it is technically still open. I suppose the biggest question in the handling of this one is, has there been a cover up here? Maybe because it involves one of their own, Tim Matuk was a police officer, or is it just a case of bad police work, plain and simple incompetence, and maybe even worse record keeping? I do think either way, the Remain family deserve this case to be looked at again from the very beginning. And I don't think any harm will come from a fair and honest review of this case. It will either confirm what the police are already saying, or if there is more evidence that comes out, surely in the name of justice, the correct thing to do is just follow the leads as they come. 
That's what Joanne's family are fighting for here, a fair investigation, as they don't think one was ever done in the first place. They think it was stricken off as a suicide way too quickly. Obviously, I've referred to a civil suit throughout this episode. The Remain family did file this suit against the Gross Point Farms and Gross Point Woods PD, as well as a number of others, including Tim Matook. However, they lost the claim and then again, they lost on appeal. Regardless, the judge did state that there are a number of disputed facts in this matter that are very disturbing. Whether or not there's any legal grounds to these disputed facts is another matter. The judge even said their case was meritorious, meaning in legal terms, likely to succeed on the merits of the case. However, it's still lost, which is very interesting to me. And to top all of this off, Joanne's family do think there's reason to believe that she had either been approached by or met with somebody from the FBI in the days leading up to her disappearance. A private investigator they hired said this meeting may have happened in the days before she died. If this is true, this is obviously a huge reason to think that somebody else might have had a hand in her death, that she wasn't being paranoid at all. However, I don't know the reason behind this suspicion around the meeting with the FBI. Did this really happen? Dateline did contact the FBI to check whether or not it did, but of course their reply only said they can either confirm nor deny such a meeting taking place. Would the FBI have an obligation to say something in the case of a murder investigation? I don't know, it certainly doesn't seem so. Maybe not if it's part of a bigger investigation on their behalf. Maybe Joanne really was deep into some dark stuff going on in Gross Point Woods. Joanne's family say they're never going to give up on justice for her. They have actually now announced a $100,000 reward for any information leading to the arrest of the person responsible for Joanne's murder. And there's the change to all petition that I mentioned earlier that you could sign if you think more work needs to be done towards justice in this case. As Michelle wrote in the petition description, there is a timeline of events in this case that is very troubling. It strongly suggests police corruption and there are obvious signs of deception and lies amongst people suspected in Joanne's disappearance. There is clear cut evidence of a cover up by local law enforcement officials that were supposed to be investigating this case. The facts are so crystal clear that even a federal judge that oversaw this case stated, the disputed facts in this matter are very disturbing and until this day remain unresolved. Yet no one in any higher law enforcement capacity or position of political power has taken this case seriously. No one has been willing to do a real investigation, make local law enforcement officials accountable and bring the suspects to justice. So that's the position of Joanne's family, the Remain family in all of this. I very much do agree there needs to be more investigation done in this case. I think there's been way too many questionable practices and questionable timelines here to say that the investigation was done fully and properly. Again, I don't think any harm will be done by an impartial investigator taking a look at this case from the very beginning. There's just way too many questions here to brush Joanne's death off as a simple suicide. Thank you so much for tuning in today. If you like what I'm doing here on my channel, then please do not forget to click that subscribe button and leave a comment down below. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Bye guys.